Hi, welcome back to Garden on the Moors. You may have been wondering why we're called Garden on the Moors, and it's because we're surrounded by beautiful moorland like this. Um, these are called the mid Cornwall Moors, and they are smaller patches of moorland which branch off from Bodmin Moor going east. Um, what we're going to do today is just have a quick look around and see if we can find any cool and unusual plants for you um, in the springtime, and maybe even some other wildlife as well. So yeah, enjoy! So we found here this really interesting flower. It's a nice bright pink one. This is called common lousewort. And it's basically the equivalent of yellow rattle, which you might know, which people call the meadow maker. It's the dry heath equivalent. It's one of its relatives. Some might say it's his cousin. Um, and what it does is it parasitizes the grass, or hemi parasitizes the grass around it. So. I don't know if you can see there, but the leaves aren't very green. They're kind of a purplish tinge to them. That's because they're not photosynthesizing that much. They're actually stealing it from other plants, especially grasses and things like that. So we've got another one down here. And you can see the grass around it is a lot shorter, even though it's on the path, compared to the grasses and things further away from it. These are much taller got more life in than the ones that are directly with it. That's because it's, what it does is it taps its root into those other plants and steals some of the sugars and the other goodness. So there we are, common lousewort. We just wanted to stop here and show you just how effective lousewort is at keeping the grass down. So look at this patch here, basically no grass. This patch here, thick with grass. And they're not even a metre apart from each other. And the difference in the colour of the grasses over here to here is just crazy. So this is, just shows what it's doing. And that will then allow less competitive plants to grow as well. So we've got mosses here and there'll be other things as well. Small trefoils, uh, little violas and things like that growing up with the lousewort. We've just come across this really interesting rock. I know it's only a rock, but if you look around, it's full of all these smashed up snail shells. They're quite pretty shells, actually. And uh, this is a thrush anvil. So, in dry weather, like we've had quite recently, when the song thrushes can't get any worms, what they'll do is they'll hunt out these snails, they'll find a good rock, and they'll whack it with their beak, smash it on the, on the rock, and then eat the nice juicy uh, mollusk on the inside, the snail flesh. But there's, I mean, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. So he's had a right old feast. Um, and the way you tell a song thrush when he's singing is that he always says the same thing over and over again. He'll tell you about three or four times and then he'll go on to the next note, tell you that one about three or four times and carry on. So that's how we know the song thrush. So we were talking about how lousewort and um, other species like that help to suppress some of the more rigorous plants like grasses. So we've got the lousewort over here again, keeping down our grasses and things, which is allowing some smaller flowers to grow. We've got one here, which is quite a, a rare flower. This is pale dog violet. Some people also call it pale heath violet. Um, we can tell it's that compared to our common dog violets, because obviously, first of all, it is paler with a milky spur at the back, which gives it its Latin name of Viola Lactea. The leaves are pointed like little arrows. They're not round, they're pointed. And underneath, they've got a purpley tinge to them. If I delicately bring that around. Purpley tinge from those veins. So that's how we know that this is pale dog violet, which is a lovely flower. And then just next to it, 
we have another heath specialist, a gorgeous blue flower called heath milkwort. And we know it's that because its leaves at the base are opposite, opposite each other in pairs, and then they start to alternate as you go further up the stem till you get to this gorgeous, cute little blue flower at the end of the stem. Now, like all the worts, these are supposed to be helpful to you. And I think that it was supposed to help with milk production, I'm guessing, or to make the milk taste better. But this is Heath Milkwort. We've got Lousewort up ahead, and we've got these gorgeous pale dog violets. So we're in a slightly damper area of the moors now. This is more marshland um, than dry heath, which is where we were seeing the pale dog violets and stuff. And in this environment, we've got lots of sphagnum moss here, which is what forms our peat. And peat is what we're standing on right now, um, which although is really nutritious and beneficial to plants, mixed in with compost on its own and damp how it should be, uh, it's quite hard for plants to get the nutrition from it. And so they have to have adapted in spe special ways to get more nutrients than what they would get from the ground. And what we've got around us here are several different species of carnivorous plant. So what they do is all of them in their own different ways are catching insects using sticky leaves and then digesting them. We've got uh, quite a common one, which is round leaved sundew. Um, which looks a lot like a Venus flytrap. It's got its hand open like that, waiting for any insect, even such a, thing, such a bigger thing as like a damselfly or a cranefly, and it will catch it in that gluey sundew and slowly go around it, and that sundew will start breaking down the insect, and that's how it will digest it. Um, we've got butterworts just next to it. This is pale butterwort, um, which is a, the one you mainly get in Cornwall, and and again, it's got sticky leaves, but it's more um, like an open flat leaf, which then something will crawl over and get stuck onto. All of these plants catch and kill insects to eat them, but they still are pollinated by insects. So they don't want to catch and kill those ones. So what they'll do is they'll shoot up a really tall flower stalk and pop a flower right at the very top so that the pollinators can get to work and do what they need to do up there and not get tangled up in the trap below. Um, so, that's a, so that's just a few of the ones around here. We've got some other species as well, which we'll try and find. And um, yeah, we'll let you know how we, get, how we get on. Now, I know we often think of boggy areas as being quite smelly places, kind of stagnant and damp and that sort of thing. But this here is a really lovely smelling plant. This is bog myrtle, and when you just stroke on its leaves and have a good old smell, it smells lovely. It smells like um, essential oils and things like that. Um, so it's a really nice thing to have, and it actually looks like it's flowering at the minute, or has finished flowering with its little catkins. And this grows in proper, obviously, boggy ground, as the, hence the name, so really damp areas, full of PT, wet ground, and um, things like that. So it's a lovely little plant to find, especially because it smells, oh, so good. So we've just managed to find another species of sundew. This is the oblong leaved sundew. So it's similar to the round leaved, but has long thin stems to catch the insects. It does it in just the same way of using that pale liquid dew, which is super sticky to trap insects and then curl around it and digest what it's caught. Here we got a sundew in action, doing exactly what it's supposed to. Day of the Triffid sort of stuff this is. So it's managed to catch an insect there in that sticky dew and then it's folding its leaves around it to then start digesting it and gain extra nutrients which it can't get from its roots in the in this super damp uh, and sterile compost below it. So we're in a more wooded area of the moors now, and just behind me is this gorgeous and probably very old bilberry, or it's also called um, hurtleberry, and what Brian's grandparents call it is oats, which is, I think, short for hurtleberry. 
Um, it's basically our native sort of variety of uh, blueberry. Um, it's just flowering now. It's, we've had loads of bumblebees going over it, um, but it's a real acidic grass, um, acidic ground specialist. Um, so if you ever use ericaceous soil, and that's obviously what we're on now, um, because it's just growing wild and it's growing all over this bank here, around the trees there, and also behind us over, over the hills here too. Um, it's a really useful plant. Um, lots of insects like it, but we also like it as well. And Bran's grandparents used to go out onto the moors, pick the yurts and make a jam out of them. We haven't tried it ourselves yet, um, but maybe we will one day. Oh, boy. You can hopefully hear over the dog huffing and puffing a cuckoo is just over on this hillside where we are gets loads of cuckoos um, we usually see well about three or four here another uh, five or so down the road um, and they absolutely love all of this rough uh, heathland and um, it's full of nice thick uh, really big caterpillars that they love to eat. They like to eat these big hairy caterpillars um, and they will lay their eggs in meadow pipit's nests. We've actually seen them doing it. We've seen a female jumping in the heather and the gorse looking for meadow pipit nests to lay her eggs into. And you, uh, in a few weeks time we'll see the males chasing females around but the males have only just came back in about last week or so. Um, and we've got two calling on this hillside here which hopefully we could pick up on the mic. We don't have a special, uh, you know, instrument to record the sounds, just a little microphone, but hopefully you can still pick it up anyways. But there we are, cuckoo. So we're in a much more marshy area of the moors now. As you can see, the water table is a lot higher here and it's a lot more open. We've got lots of ponds and pools and um, we've got some old, uh, this looks like old willow car behind us, these dead trees. And we've got much different flowers here. So we've got um, marsh marigolds, which are these really big, bright yellow flowers, which are um, on all the different um, uh, stumps there. We've got cuckoo flower, which is um, the small pinky one. Um, and that's actually a really important food plant for orange tip butterflies. And then there's a few dots as well of ragged robin, which is the more vibrant pink. And it looks like its petals have been split and uh, fringed off. And um, they all love having their feet wet the whole time and they really enjoy these proper marshy areas. Um, and it's just looking lovely at the minute with all the different spots of colour in amongst the horsetail. I forgot to mention one other amazing flower here, which is the bog bean. It's, uh, it doesn't sound very nice, bog bean, but it's got these um, quite tall stems and on it are proper white star-shaped flowers with nice little fringing around them and pink bases. They're absolutely beautiful and they've just now started flowering as well. So I'll try and get some close-ups of them for you. So obviously all of this marshy open pond area means that we've got predators for the frogs and the slugs and things like this grass snake. Awesome. And just to the side, we've got a slow worm. I don't know why I'm whispering, they can't hear anything, they've got no ears, but that's actually the first grass snake I've ever seen. Awesome. Oh, and you can tell it's a grass snake because of that yellow collar it's got. Brilliant. The last flower I want to show you is one of my favorites to find on the marsh, and it's actually my favorite violet. It's called the marsh violet. Um, it's got gorgeous pale lilac flowers that really fold over at the back and it's got these really big uh, 10 pence sort of piece leaves. Um, they love this sort of marshy environment and they're actually the main food plant for one of the butterflies that live around here, the small pearl bordered fritillary, um, which is a really pretty butterfly. 
especially when it has its wings closed, it's one of those where it's actually the underside of its wings is more interesting than when it has them open. And their little caterpillars feed on those big leaves and um, that's why they do so well in the mid-cornwall moors. So yeah, another nice gorgeous little flower for you. There we are, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give a big thumbs up and subscribe for more and we'll see you again next time. Cheers. Mm -hmm.